Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm here in Barcelona at Avalanche Summit 2023, and Sonny and I got to sit down with Emi Gunsir, CEO of Avalavs and founder of Avalanche, to talk about this event, the Avalanche ecosystem, and also some exciting new ideas that are being explored in the Avalanche ecosystem about bringing GPT to blockchains. Uh, so this is an hour long conversation where we went deep and uh, really got to pick Imin's brain uh, about where he th sees blockchains going in the future with regards to artificial intelligence and large language models. So I hope you'll enjoy it. So without further delay, here's our conversation with Imin. Imin, thanks for joining us. Hi, Celestial. Thanks for being on the show. Um, once again, um, so this is going out on the interop, but also on Epicenter. And so our Epicenter guests will remember you from your numerous appearances. The uh, last time was about a year and a half ago when uh, you came on to talk about Avalanche. And before that, you were on the show to talk about a bunch of stuff. I mean, a lot of your research previously from when you were at Cornell, um, uh, Bitcoin NG, selfish mining. You could also write a paper with Vlad about uh, the DAO, and, uh, which turned out to be mostly correct <laughs> right. and so um, that's all. <laughs> yeah so you know maybe um for those who don't, don't know you may, maybe give a background uh on your trajectory and sure. how you got to become the ceo of a major blockchain sure uh so let's see i was a professor at cornell for many years so i started out there in 2001 at a time when peer-to-peer -peer systems were just taking off and i was always fascinated by self-organizing systems i was always into building really complex systems that could give you a strong guarantee and stand behind it. That was sort of my driving motivation across all of my research. And uh, I started out by working on a peer-to-peer -peer currency called Karma for file sharing networks. It had proof of work minting in it in 2002, so as before the Bitcoin white paper. It did not have consensus via proof of work. So Satoshi had a huge step up from the work I did. Uh, but, uh, but I was thinking along those lines a long time ago. And in any case, I've been working on uh, everything blockchain uh, for a long time now. Worked on uh, characterizing the security of Bitcoin. We found the biggest known flaw in Bitcoin, known as selfish mining. Uh, we uh, worked on, uh, on doing a bunch of other things, on characterizing decentralization in blockchains, on securing coins at rest, on building Bitcoin NG, this protocol that is the next generation. That's uh, faster, better. And uh, then most recently, I've been working on lightweight consensus protocols, and that work led to the Avalanche uh, system. And uh, I spun that, spun that out and uh, left Cornell about a year ago to focus on it full time. What has been the biggest change from going from being like an academic to running a multi-billion dollar uh, <laughs> project? Uh, that's a good question. So I, I think about that all the time. So um, we were at the forefront of research and development. I was worried before I left academia that I would I would not be able to do research, that it would be hard to to attract top notch talent, that uh, that we would essentially just kind of fall into a rut uh, where you try to digit to to monetize something, and that has not been the case. I was so pleasantly surprised that we are still actively engaged in cutting edge research in in systems, and uh, and so that's been good, uh, and that was surprising to me. Uh, the other changes in my lifestyle are that it's insane uh, what, uh, what how my life has changed from doing whatever I used to do to doing whatever I used to do, plus so much more now because I have to do these other things as well uh, that relate to running a large company. So that, that's that been the biggest change for me. Um, but overall, it's been a fantastic change. So uh, in academia, you always have to wait for someone else to take your ideas and take them to completion in the process good bits are dropped and you know or maybe they take a good idea but they execute poorly on it and uh, and when you are in command of your own destiny it's a very satisfying feeling so it's been a great change for me what is the part that you miss the most i miss teaching i miss teaching so badly i have dreams where i teach and uh, and it's uh, i used to enjoy it immensely and uh, it's actually very addictive yeah. and uh, uh, and I, I used to love uh, that process, and I, it was it's also very satisfying because you can see, like, literally in people's eyes when you in, introduce a concept like multi-threading. They don't really know how it works until someone explains it to them. And those aha moments are so 
Uh, so satisfying. So I miss that a lot. Um, I do not miss the class size. So towards the end of my career, I started out teaching classes that were like 40, 40 students. And towards the end of my career, I was teaching 480. Wow. And, you know, the, this computer science area has exploded. Well, 480 is a lot, you know, just, uh, I had like 30 TAs, just the TA group alone was similar to my initial class size. That's so that's crazy. I mean, it, it, anybody who's interested in, you know, going back and, you know, uh, learning more about Amin's um, previous research should definitely go back and listen to those old episodes of Epicenter. They're, they're old, but they're still super relevant. So I think and uh, they're fun. Yeah. And they're fun. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I go back. <laughs> Lots of drama back then yeah. over the technical issues. Different drama. Different yeah. drama. Yeah. We're here at this like beautiful venue. Uh, and this is the second Avalanche Summit. Uh, it's, it's honestly, it's like a very impressive conference. Uh, and, um, and so wondering what are the main takeaways for you after three days here? For me, um, let's see. I think this is a, this is an occasion where we come together. And, you know, post-pandemic, we all work in our little universes, so I kind of get cooped up. And uh, it's easy to lose track of where we are. It's easy to lose track of one's, one's community. Or, you know, you always have some sense of who they are, but it's a nebulous thing you constructed in your head. And this is the opportunity to see them. So uh, my main takeaway is just the, the vibe right now in the middle of a bear market. Um, is so much more positive and so much more growth oriented than I thought. And so I had to do a huge adjustment in my head from where I thought we were to what I actually see. So uh, so I saw a lot of companies. Uh, they're really interested in building black blockchains and something that will resonate with this audience. They want to to uh, to create a custom specific, you know, like an application specific chain. So there's quite a few of those around. Um, VCs, there are far fewer VCs. They are very, very loud online, right? And these are people who are like, oh, yeah, like they act like they are fully committed. But when you look around, they're not actually around. And uh, so they've been, most of them have been wiped out and or uh, they're, they're not, they, they don't seem to be as committed in actual fact as they seem to be making noise online. So I wasn't actually at uh, last year's Avalanche Summit, mm -hmm. but from everyone I've talked to here, they said that they enjoyed this year's much better because last year they felt there was, yeah, a lot of suits, a lot of VCs, yeah. but everyone like this year, far fewer. Yeah. But was so this, a, was this a, an impact of just like the market or did you guys make this like an active no. effort of how to? No, 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 no. We invited all the VCs as, as always. And, uh, and, uh, but I think in general, like I, I was just at consensus and I saw far fewer VCs there as well. I think overall as a sector, this area is not attracting as many dollars as it used to. They're probably back home there's still tons of funds like yeah. th th there's more funds they're sloshing around yeah. they're sloshing around yeah. uh they're probably back home looking at uh, ai deals right yeah. so <laughs> that's where the money is going uh, but uh but i i love this this is this is the vibe that i really wanted to cultivate just let's just build stuff there's so much undelivered promise so far and uh you know all this like coin coin centric vc investments where people create coins just for the sake of creating them yeah that wasn't healthy at all and i'm glad we're sort of flushing that out of our stars so what's the most interesting stuff you've seen this year? And you know, actually maybe like I before to answer that because if I do something <laughs> out, then I'll get this mail from the people I left out. Okay. Well then maybe at a higher level, like what's the ki kinds of innovations, or the sort of like more general industry uh, directions that are, uh, that are sort of playing out and specifically like, like I wasn't here last year and like, to be honest, like, like I've discovered a lot of the Avalanche ecosystem here because mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of my time in Cosmos, like Sunny and and so, um, how has the Avalanche ecosystem sort of evolved in the year and things that people are working on? Yeah, great question. We have many more subnets deployed this year than last year. I think last year we were uh, trying to get the subnet idea out to the masses. This year, we've done that. Uh, we are already seeing a lot of traction. There are more than 55 production subnets, even as we speak. Uh, there are hundreds in uh, testing, and uh, there are lots of uh, great pro um, uh, subnets, great uh, chains in the pipeline. So um, one of the big trends I saw this year is gaming. They love having their own chain. They love having their in-game economy on uh, their own blockchain, on their terms with their own virtual machines. So uh, we're seeing that happen. We're seeing that happen with AAA games. So for example, Shrapnel is here and uh, they have a great game coming out. It's like Counter-Strike++. I don't know if you guys got a chance to play with it. Those of you who were at Consensus, they had a great booth there. I played it there. Just amazing game, far better than Counter Strike, and uh, the game game dynamics are fantastic. The artwork is fantastic. 
We have another game. Are you a gamer yourself? I am not. Okay. I'm a terrible gamer. <laughs> you know, the last game I was good at is Frogger. Okay, so let me <laughs> let me date myself. <laughs> you know, I was there when like Pong was a thing. You know, so uh, not much of a gamer. Uh, but uh, but these games, like they really, like I don't know, it's just, they're so realistic, so beautifully done. There's another one uh, that's another AAA game called Godzilla that's coming out soon uh, later this year. Amazing, amazing production values. Like the universe, I played that game a little bit. Uh, they flew me out. They 3D recorded me, kind of like they did to Gollum or whatever, and they made an NPC out of me in the game. So there's there's a there's a there's a copy of me in the game who like looks into the camera and says dramatic things, and you can unload the clip into my head, and I'll respawn and say dramatic things again. It's it's really fun, and uh, I loved it. And if you play these games, you just kind of lose yourself in the game, like the the. You know, you can replace your arms, you can replace your legs. There's like mechs and stuff, bots and drones flying around. Just Counter-Strike could be so much cooler. And these guys are delivering on that promise. So, and then of course, you, everything uh, you buy is an NFT in the game. Amazing, amazing show. How, how do you, um, so, you know, I've definitely noticed a lot of focus on gaming here. A lot of people have been talking about that. It feels like right now, it, there's this like weird culture war between the much wider, bigger gaming community out there and crypto. Like, mm -hmm. My take is I think they're still mad at us for stealing all their GPUs. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but like, how do you guys plan? Like, you know, remember like Discord added like crypto features and then they yeah. got so much backlash yeah, that like, undo it. Yeah. How do you guys plan on like, so I see that all these games that are being developed right now, but how do you plan on reaching out to this like more active gamer community? I think, uh, so this is not my domain at all. We just provide the platform for, for people to thrive on. Uh, but I did play with the games and I know what the game designers did. It is so smooth that uh, the, it, the I think what people really react to is the crypto community's propensity to push coins into everything and, and to put cumbersome uh, sort of front ends in front of stuff that you want to do naturally. So in these games, when you like get a gun, that's an NFT you just received. And it's not it's not part of like it's it's, it's not in your face. You didn't have to buy coins, etc. So it's so natural, and these people end up interacting with the blockchain without knowing they're interacting with the blockchain. I've said this many times before. Um, that's that's one of the signs of of success that people are using your system and they don't even know. So if we're not in people's faces, we're not going to get the flat backlash. It's that simple. Cool. Well, let's let's dive into the. The, the nitty gritty a little bit more and uh, some of the technical aspects of, of Avalanche and you you made an announcement uh, yesterday that um, we kind of titled this episode as GPT for, for, for smart contracts so we'll also talk about that but let's maybe just start with a refresher on how Avalanche is architectured and the different parts of that like the different chains so the C chain the P chain the X chain so that people get a sense of like how that all works and then we can get into some of the uh, more in depth that I think. Sure. Yeah. So there are a couple of things that make Avalanche unique and interesting. Uh, the main one that got us started down this path of issuing a new, uh, new, new chain is uh, the new consensus protocol. It's unique. It's there is none other like it, and uh, uh, it achieves consensus via this mechanism that's very similar to gossip for those people who are familiar with it. But it's a consensus mechanism as opposed to just the gossip information dissemination mechanism. So it, it, it uh, achieves agreement at the end of the day using this very lightweight mechanism that allows our, our system to achieve consensus in about a second. We advertise a second, we're really actually, it, in actual fact, usually below a second to finality. Um, and it can do so without compromising decentralization at all. We can have millions of nodes participating in every decision and still achieve those uh, amazing uh, turnaround times. So that's one. The second thing that's interesting about Avalanche, like Cosmos, is uh, its ability to uh, support more than a single chain. So uh, Avalanche, in fact, there are three of us. There aren't that many chains uh, that have this architecture. So prior to us, there was well, initially there was Bitcoin, right? One asset, one chain. Then came Ethereum and other chains like that, which are multi-asset, single chain. And now you're seeing the rise of the next generation, the highest tech in the space, which is multi-asset, multi-chain. And in Avalanche, you can have multiple chains in parallel, each running their own virtual machine, each with their own gas asset, each with their own staking asset. And that allows people to build a chain, build, build a gaming chain, for example, that's completely shielded from the load on the other chains. We have certain chain, and we have a generalized smart contract chain called C-Chain. 
it's, uh, it's an EVM, and so you interact with it the same way you do with you do Solidity programming on it. It's a much faster version of Ethereum, essentially. Uh, and you can create more C2, C3 chains if you want to. Uh, we have this other chain called X Chain for assets. Uh, so if you just want to easily issue a token, you can do it there. And then we have this coordination chain called P Chain. That's those three are the ones we started out with. The coordination chain is for finding the other chains that are in the system. And as I mentioned, there are about 55 of them, even as I speak. So that's our big, big architecture. It allows anybody to create their own chain subject to their own rules with their own validators. We don't have centralized components. You don't have to go through a hub to communicate. We have a uh, and uh, uh, so uh, IBC like um, uh, communication mechanism that we call warp. So any any blockchain can talk to any other blockchain. And uh, overall, so those are the two things that make us unique. The third thing I think is a mentality uh, thing uh, that that we, is very important to us, which is to use the best of science in everything we do. Uh, so it's not just the platform itself, but our bridges use different technology. Uh, we've been building exchanges that are using secure technologies such that even the exchange operator cannot misbehave. So there's a lot of tooling that's happening around uh, Avalanche that's, uh, that's essentially bringing new new science into the space. Hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about the the, the interoperability protocol, the WARP protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think for people who listen to this channel, uh, there's there's an understanding of how IBC works with light clients that are able to verify the state of another chain and, and essentially mint assets on another chain and sort of burn assets on the initial chain. And that's how we arrive at being able to transfer tokens from one chain to another. Uh, in, in Avalanche, it's totally different because yep. there is no light client by, by virtue of the, the consensus mechanism, or at least that's how... Sonny's explained to me earlier today. Yeah, he's not wrong. Um, he's not <laughs> You can I'm have light price, but it doesn't work. Yeah, correct. Warp does not work the way the way IBC works. Um, we use aggregated signatures uh, across the validators that that compri comprise a uh, blockchain. So uh, if your chain wants to send a message to me, essentially what we do is we construct a quorum signature from the set of nodes, the validators that make up your chain that say, in this chain at this moment in time, such and such an event happened. Perhaps you're sending a message to me, or perhaps you burned coins, or what have you. And so that becomes a, um, uh, a message in a well-understood parsable format by any other uh, blockchain that wants to consume it. And then that can be taken by any other chain and used to do the corresponding action, an invocation or creation, minting of view coins on that other chain. How scalable is that? Because one of the nice things about Avalanche consensus protocol is it can sta scale to millions, millions of nodes, nodes yeah. but these aggregate signatures, how well do they scale? That's a great question. And... Uh, so there are lots of different cryptographic techniques for compressing those uh, those signatures. The uh, the technique that we use comes from uh, 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 you know from from uh, BLS signatures. So Dan Bonet and his team at Stanford. Um, it's uh, incredibly scalable. And uh, the time I was worried about this uh, because you know it's, uh, there's called cryptographic constructs, and I think the Ethereum community knows very well that a lot of them don't pan out in practice. Uh, there's some feasibility issues that you run into that are not evident in theory. So um, BLS signatures, the way they're implemented is incredibly fast. So a warp message can be constructed in hundreds of milliseconds uh, across thousands of, uh, of uh, validators. So if your blockchain is, you know, again, say 10,000 validators or less, you're looking at less than a second for messaging. Uh, you're typically looking at about 300 milliseconds for message, for message construction still needs to be parsed on the other side, but that's super fast. And you can, it can become an input to a smart contract on the other side. Yeah, that's, I guess that's the nice thing about BLS is you can kind of aggregate Ooh. as you gossip, right? Ooh. You know, Ooh. Unlike other aggregate signatures where you need n square communication. Right, exactly. So what are some of the ways that um, the Avalanche consensus protocol has evolved over the years? Yeah. I know like there were some design goals that uh, got set out with this making this very like leaderless style protocol, and then those have sort of had to shift over time. Yep. Uh, can you talk a bit about how it's evolved? Sure. So uh, there are so the Avalanche protocol itself, when it came out, um, it's it's actually uh, it's not a single protocol. There are many protocols, a new family entirely. So uh, uh, for those of you that are listening, that are familiar with uh, protocols like Cosmos um, and. Uh, Let's actually take Cosmos. Cosmos is great because a very well understood, sound, uh, really, really nice protocol. Uh, we call that, it's in the classical family. Um, there are other protocols like ETH2, EOS, etc. 
they are signature aggregation uh, protocols. Uh, they don't have a view change, as you know, well, process to not, I don't know how technical we want to get into this, but Let's do it. Oh, like, well, okay. <laughs> so uh, there are a bunch of protocols that are uh, uh, that are uh, you know fairly specific. They do signature aggregate uh, signature aggregation, which becomes very very cumbersome the more you uh, validators you have. Avalanche, when it came out, came out as a huge series of protocols. Uh, there were like four or five in the initial paper, and uh, it's grown since then. And um, I think there are two different, two surprising things that happened. When we came out with the initial Avalanche protocol, it was leaderless. And uh, it's still, that protocol is still there in every way. All of that code is still there. So in any slot, anyone can propose. But if you do run a, a protocol with that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of modality, then uh, you can get into situations where there's a lot of conflicts because, you know, you've, We've all been at conversations where two people are constantly talking at the same time. There's a pause, two people start the sentence at the same time. Then they have to stop, back off, look at each other in the eye, you know, and then you, then you start again and sometimes it can repeat itself. So um, to, to stem that, uh, we added a soft leader mechanism to Avalanche. So it's not a hard leader. It's different from classical protocols. There's no view change. There's no leader election. It's just, as you know, like in this slot, you know, we're going to give we, we will all pause a little bit more, uh, but Sonny doesn't have to pause as much because it's his turn then. So that's, uh, uh, that's the kind of heuristic that we added to uh, cut down on congestion in the network. It was incredibly effective. And, uh, but the, the uh, sort of the fundamental nature of the, the protocol underneath did not change. But more recently, we made another change. Um, it's just uh, maybe uh, 10 days ago, uh, we did the Cortina update. And so um, the, uh, you know, the, one of the products... When we went out, we had two different consensus protocols that we used and two different data structures that we did. The C chain was an EVM uh, chain with an you know, Ethereum virtual machine running on it that created a totally ordered linear chain. The X chain was an actual DAG protocol. So we created a graph, a directed acyclic graph. And, uh, and you know, as an academic, you know, this is incredibly appealing. So I was like, oh, yeah, a DAG is so much better than a chain because you can grow it. You know, it's, you can work on this side of the graph while you and I work on this other side of the graph and it can proceed in parallel. So theoretically, it has far more uh, capacity. So uh, then we went out with it. So one problem, of course, is it's more complex. That's not a big deal, right? We have some of the best developers and, you know, we can handle complexity. But uh, the second thing that, that I discovered to my surprise, is that all of the exchanges in the world are written for linear chains. Mm -hmm. So even if you have this DAG, they don't know what to do with it. And uh, they keep wanting to ask a question like, did this happen before this or vice versa? And in a DAG, you have concurrent operations. That was the appeal of the DAG. So yeah. I spent countless hours talking to Chinese exchanges and saying, look, you know, the question you're asking is, is malformed like that. Don't be asking that question so we can go fast. But then they say, no, our systems are designed this way. We have to ask this question. So that ended up uh, forcing us into rethinking the DAG issue. And with the Cortina update, we're like, okay, look, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a hit on performance on the X chain. Not a big deal. Uh, we are still have ample performance. So uh, we'll get rid of the DAG and we'll build a linear chain just to make exchange integration simpler. Also, not just that, but also to make warp integration simpler. So now warp works across all of the subnets. And uh, we got rid of the DAG, which I think was, you know, a detail, I miss it um, as an academic, but as a practical person that was stuff to work, it was one of the best moves we did. Yeah. When Avalanche becomes, you know, biggest chain, that will teach them about DAG. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. At some point, the world was not quite ready for this. <laughs> this mechanism you talk about with the uh, sort of, it's like, let's all kind of soft agree that someone is going to come first mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll all respect that and... How does that respect break down when you have these MEV competitions start to form? Um, it, it works just fine. So um, if an MEVer jumps in, that's fine. Uh, we're going to prioritize the person who's in the allotted slot. So uh, the, that does not give any advantage to MEVers. The way to win the MEV game on Avalanche is actually very straightforward. You, you just need a crap ton of validators. And to do that, you need to stake a crap ton of AVAX. So in a sense, we turn the MEV game on its head and say, look, if you want to play this game, like it's a game that cannot be stopped. People want to play. 
yeah. will want to, to game your protocol no matter what. It's like there's a there's a well well uh, well understood way. You need as many slots as you can to your name, and the way to acquire that is to stake a, a lot of AVAX. And so that's that's exactly how that works. Let's um let's talk about this AI stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. Chat GPT, smart contract writing, which is not actually like when I was listening to the talk or someone described it to me earlier. It was like, oh, we're going to use GPT to write smart contracts. That's not at all the idea. You know, I think the idea goes even further. It sort of abstracts away the entire like, oh yeah, um, sort of way that we think about writing applications um, or, or giving instruction to like a, a, a machine. So yeah, talk about this this idea and um, yeah, well, what's what's uh, what's what's with it? What's with it? <laughs> gladly, gladly. So uh, it's a very obvious idea. So once I tell everyone what it is, they'll be like, yeah, I, I see how that could work. And uh, and it's uh, it's also a very bimodal idea. It's either a great idea or a terrible idea. It's not an in between. It's not incremental. It's just not, and it's also not something I heard before. But once I say it, it'll be obvious. So here's the idea. Um, we um, are starting. I'm, I, I'm super excited about this. We're launching a new project to build a new subnet on Avalanche that's powered by AI, specifically by large language models uh, that are using these generative transformers, uh, pre-trained transformers known as GPTs. Uh, so what are these things, right? So these things are, you know, at the end of the day, they're giant matrices, but they really are engines that have been trained on the totality of digital stuff we have on the internet. They've read everything on the internet in every language, and they've constructed this intelligence, so to speak, that knows how to react to situations that are provided to it in natural language. And so what's the proposal? We build a new blockchain. This blockchain has as its execution engine one of these trained language models. It has a, a, a generative pre-trained uh, transformer. So this GPT is in there. Uh, think of it as a no-code blockchain, a blockchain where there is no transaction format. There is no bytecode. There is no solidity. There is no WASM. There is no other programming language whatsoever. When you want to do something, you write it. In what language? In whatever language this thing is trained in. It happens to be almost every language. So you write it in English. You know, I give to Sebastian five AVAX. I write this in text in my, as my transaction with those letters. It's, it's like ASCII characters. And that's part of the blockchain. And then you can write something that's uh, kind of like a check, but more uh, more expressive. You can write something like, hey, uh, I give to Sonny, uh, you know, 500 AVAX, assuming that he can complete his fundraise for his new movie that he's making. If not, if he can't do that, I want my money back. That's not something I could write on the check that, that my bank gives me, right? And it's, and it's being executed, whatever you write, is being executed by a very smart, neutral counterparty that is the intelligence inside that uh, that ai engine so there's no more programming we all become programmers we can all write smart contracts you can start something like i now start a sequence of interactions uh using the rules of chess and magnus plays the white pieces and you know we play the black pieces uh you know i don't have to define the rules of chess yeah, yeah. right if i were writing a program it would be this long and then it would be complicated and i have to do all that like checkmate checking and so on it's expensive here this is just like i i rely on the inherent intelligence that this thing built um i can say this contract uh will divide the uh, you know we, we wrote a song together let's say we'll we'll divide the royalties between the three of us fairly and we now appeal to the notion of fairness built into the ai mm. So it's okay. just, it's an amazing new future. Is it crazy? Could be. Uh, could, could it be a bad idea? Yeah, it could be. But it's an experiment worth doing. So in, in the talk, you described this this notion of uh, interpretation. So we have like an intent. And yes. so we, we vocalize that intent as like language or like uh, like you just said, right? Like I want to send these tokens to this person under this condition or we're like, well, that, that's the that's way that we describe things as humans. And then we translate that into, uh, into code, right? Like... Uh, Rust or Go or, or Solidity or whatever, and that gets translated into bytecode. And the issue is that between these different intents, well, there can be sort of things that are lost in translation and worse yet, like bugs, right? So like re-entrancy attacks and things like that, where you say, okay, like I want to do that, but I haven't thought that there's like re-entrancy or there's like mm -hmm. this particular bug in this interpreter. Does this idea imply that in the background there's actually code being written or are we are we sort of thinking about a different type of VM here that's like 
Yes, we are. Okay, we so it's like about... language model to byte code, or is it language? No, like how... absolutely no code anywhere. Okay. There's going to be no byte code. There's no code construction. The AI is not creating code for you. The AI is interpreting the actual text you write. So, yeah, but at some point, at some point, like there has to be a transaction, right? And so that transaction yes. gets run by a validator, and that uh, validator is executing GPT. some machine, some machine code. No, it's executing GPT. It's running the the matrices that actually power the AI. So you're having a conversation the way you have it with Chat GPT, yeah. and the validator is executing whatever the language model is coming up with in response to the prompts that are coming in as transactions. So there's no code construction, absolutely no Rust, no bytecode, no like bit to But the state change, like how does the state change happen? Oh, so, yeah. So, so like that, I guess my question is like, at what point does the GPT model interact with a state change? The yeah. GPT model, every validator has a GPT model in it yeah. and it has an account, uh, uh, some kind of an account abstraction where it associates token balances with addresses. So if in response, if you tell it to modify one of those things, and it's a uh, pre-prompts, you know, they're in the Genesis vertex, so to speak, uh, instructed to, then it affects that change. So if I say, hey, you know, uh, I would like to give five AVAX, um, and I am authorized to do this, then it's, it's going to make that change in a central account abstraction. So we have one AI and one accounting ledger, so to speak, that's kept in every validator. The AI engine has to be deterministic, by the way. So that's one of the restrictions that this approach requires. And, uh, and so when the transaction is seen at the validators, they all see what's being asked. They apply the validity rules that they have been pre, pre-prompted, and then they make the effect of the, the, the change that, 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 that's required by the transaction. How does, uh, how is security going to work in this world? Because one thing I've like, <laughs> you know, ChatGPT is great, but like as you use it more, you start to realize it does some weird things yes. in edge cases. And like, Absolutely. you know, hallucinates. It hallucinates. And you hallucinate that I've got like a <laughs> max. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like if I do like trans, if I like, even when I'm coding, like mm-hmm. you realize when I, you know, it's great for generating test cases and all mm-hmm. this stuff. But then you start reading the code. You're like, oh, uh, that's, yeah. uh, you're making some bugs. You still have to go review stuff. Right. And, everything. and so if there's no standard, like today with like smart contracts, we can like that. If we have byte code, we can like, you know, do actual like, form, you know, if you're going to go full, you go full formal verification. But at the very least, you have some way of like auditing that this mm-hmm. thing is doing things mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah. While with the GPT system, there's no rules to audit. Absolutely. So uh, let's tease that apart. There are so many concerns. As I said, this is either a great idea or a terrible idea and not nothing in between. So um, uh, let's see. One of the big criticisms with these these machines is uh, these new emerging machines is that you you don't know what they have learned, right? You can't audit what's inside, etc., etc. I fully agree with that. We have to just adopt it. We have to own it, right? So uh, your Tesla drives itself. Is it gonna go crash every now and then? You know, until it's trained to be to not do that, it will. It's kind of like a learning, you know, 15 year old kid who's learning to drive. So, uh, it's same with this. So we will have to make sure that whatever AI we use is actually intelligent. It does actually have a good grasp of what it's supposed to do. So I I'm hopeful on this front though that we interact with each other. You know, I don't really know what's inside your brain and. Uh, uh, but somehow we managed to all get along, all like, you know, one of eight billion of us. So, uh, so, uh, and I'm very hopeful that the AI evolution will actually speed up and we'll build these, uh, these engines that are really, really smart very soon. It'll happen far faster than people think it will. So that's one thing. The, uh, the other thing, prompt engineering, hallucinations, etc. That's, that's a huge concern. Uh, this is why I want to run this as an open project. This is why I need everyone's help because uh, we need to experiment with this. So, uh, undoubtedly, if I were to specify a, a lending service in English right now, um, you know, I can do it, right? There's a lending service, a, it has a bunch of pools, the pools do this and that. And, you know, on the back end, uh, the, uh, the machine will keep track of accounts and do the lending. But undoubtedly, my specification will leave something open. And you know, a smart person like you will come along, and you'll be able to say, you know, you know, whatever, redefine what you know Gun just said to, you know, change all the commas into whatever. It is. You can do all sorts of funky things to to trip it up. And uh, what I think will happen over time is we will come up with libraries of preambles, 
so as to restrict what comes afterwards. And, um, and that I think will give us a, a modicum of safety. But it's, it is a multi-year project. I don't think like this is, this is going to be a fun project. I think it's fun. And, um, so the lawyers are the only ones who are going to keep <laughs> that. Or we all become lawyers. Right, so I, I I I agree with that. I mean, lawyers who know how to write fine print, you know, the fine print is there for a reason, and so it'll turn into into uh, into uh, uh, what we call this thing COA, coin operated agent. Yeah. It's going to turn into preambles for COAs. I mean, this kind of extends this idea can work on a blockchain, and certainly it would be cool to see that come come into existence. Um, but it could also extend to any computing environment. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have like a JavaScript VM in, in our browsers that yeah. executes code in a similar way. And yeah. so like, are there other um, attempts to do this sort of thing outside of crypto? Is it something that was like inspired by other, it's like, it's like a very novel idea that I think like, just expands outwards. Out uh, of blockchain. Well, I'm glad you think it's novel. No, it's uh, I was just kind of sitting at home thinking about AI stuff and thought, Hey, we have to put this into a validator. Um, I haven't seen the, uh, I mean, I'm, everybody and their brother is trying to work on the next GPT engine, yeah. and uh, and these things are going to find their way into uh, all sorts of tooling. Um, but uh, you know, I'm, undoubtedly that's happening. But I haven't seen anybody talk about putting it into in a valid into a blockchain before. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there was this like interesting article uh, I was just talking about before the episode, but like a, a memo that came out like from a leaked uh, leaked memo from a Google employee talking mm -hmm. about like. You know, they're competing with OpenAI, but he's like, actually, the biggest competitor right now is like the open source LLM. Mm -hmm. Like, so Facebook released their open source LLM, LLM, and like the model is much smaller than what like uh, GPT, like OpenAI and Google have. But it's actually from a, you know, UX perspective is out like just the open source iteration on it is now competing, uh, and like you know, in surveys that they're like, oh yeah, these are over fifty percent of the time people like don't care between these open source ones versus like chat Ooh. GPT. So and I think building this like sta uh, open platform, like a uh, neutral platform in a public way is very important. Mm -hmm. One of the, I, I'm really excited. I, I'm happy that you're like really ex thinking about this because one of the things I've been a little bit um, like admittedly uh, thinking about like for, for a couple, a couple of weeks now is like, what is crypto like a great stagnation technology? And I hope not. Yeah. I don't think we're stagnating at all. Well, I know we're innovating quite a bit. So, so, so the, my, my, my question is like, I feel we were in a period of great stagnation. Yes, that's true. And that's, that's why I'm here, by the way. You know, I was sick and tired of listening to crypto Twitter mull over the same damn topics over and over. How do you switch to proof of stake? Why does it take us six years to do this? I don't know. Um, how do you handle identity management on the blockchain? I don't want to hear anybody else talk about this. That's why we have this other push uh, on institutional blockchains, uh, where I just want to show people by example, this is how you do this. It's not rocket science. It's super yeah. pragmatic. At the Avalanche, we're very pragmatic. And this is how you do it. Let's put an end to this discussion once and for all. We don't need 15 working groups and 50,000 white papers and, and so on for around this. Very doable, very pragmatic solutions exist. I, what I'm telling, I mean, from my little bit of meta, meta layer, where it's like I felt like crypto is very much about like taking the state of the world and like redistributing power. Yes, but it just feels that like, wait, if we're entering this like inflection point on like technology, like power dynamic, like trying to redistribute power doesn't make sense. Versus like the the real power distribution. Like, you know the story of the dreadnought? No, um, I know dreadnoughts. Yeah, so What's I believe dreadnoughts caused World War One. Uh, so what's the story of the dreadnoughts? So in the 19th century, yeah. Britain controlled the seas, like, you know, 10 times as many ships as the rest of Europe combined, uh, at which you control the seas, you control the world. Then one admiral, his name is Jackie Fisher, he commissioned the creation of the Dreadnought, which was Ooh. the best ship in the world. It was faster, more guns, you know, further guns, better defenses, everything. And what it did was it made every other gun in the ship in the world obsolete. And the Germans saw that like, oh, we want one too. And then the British made one, and then the Germans made one. And then they kind of did this like arms race. But you went from a world where Britain had 10 times as many ships as the rest of the world to a world where Britain and Germany had the same number of dreadnoughts. Ooh. And so it's like technology in like just like, up, you know, a creative destruction mm -hmm. is actually like when you're past is how like real power redistribution happens. Yes, it does. Yeah. And so I think like crypto is that's what I meant by stagnation based technology. It's not innovating 
new innovation, if that makes sense. I maybe disagree with that. Maybe that's controversial. Well, I disagree right. with that. I disagree with that. Okay. Like, there's so much energy like just behind this, right? Okay. And uh, and uh, and I think we are addressing all of those things. That that I, I think you're right. That for a long time we were kind of you know whirling around the the same drain pipe uh, without much progress, but. Uh, we are solving the custodian solutions. Like the institutions weren't able to get into the space; they didn't understand custody. That's that's done. Um, uh, there were a whole bunch of problems with people's understanding of crypto assets. Done. Um, I agree that wallets are terrible. We're trying to address that with this thing called the core wallet, trying to make it much more intuitive. Uh, and we talked about the other problems, like you know, switching to proof of stake, which is not a two-second thing. Uh, we talked about uh, distributed identity. There's uh, going to be other things. And um, uh, no, I don't think we're stagnating. New assets are coming on chain. It's when a hard time to be in crypto. So what I mean is more like crypto so far has been mostly about taking things that have existed in a centralized way. Yes. Decentralized. Yes. Right? So like the web internet revolution came like three decades ago and crypto has been like, and finance, you know, came you know, 100 years ago. Oh, you know, and any, well, maybe even more. Yeah. But we've been like taking, we're like, let's say to take the web as an example, right? Crypto has been feeling like it's been playing catch up where it's like, okay, all this internet infrastructure has existed for three decades and let's now figure out how to decentralize it. Mm -hmm. What's exciting to me about this AI stuff that you're like pushing is like, oh, we have our ability right now to like put our foot in the door at the beginning yes. of this revolution. Yes, absolutely. And it's high time to do that. It's great for crypto because anybody can now become a smart contract programmer anyone can interact with a smart contract we don't have to worry about you know what comes after solidity no i don't know what i think language should come after solidity so if we can make this work it's going to be amazing imagine everybody being able to talk to ave you just write i want to borrow so much money and it says well i'm sorry i can only give you this much and then you say well okay well then give me that much that's your sequence we call it kind of a sequence abstraction in this core world so um and you can do it. But is the idea is the idea is the idea here for these large language models to act to write Ave or just to interact with the thing? So like is is that the next step? Is to actually both, write the both. application? So Stani comes along to this blockchain and says this transaction starts a new sequence, well, which starts by defining what the landing platform is. A landing platform is a pool. Into the pool, liquidity providers put their tokens. Out of this pool, other people can borrow if they provide over collateralized tokens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, uh, and then after that, anyone can come in in their own native language, whatever it might be, Italian, Spanish, whatever, Finnish, they talk to it to, 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 to borrow coins against it. So it's both to define the smart contract and to interact with it. It's just imagine just text after text after text. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a mess, right? So that's going to be like, I mean, I, I would like most of the interactions to be in English so I can follow along. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how it, it pans out. Stani might say all interactions subsequent to the first transaction must be in English. Yeah. And then, then it's going to be easier to follow in Explorers. It's just a funny world to think about. It's going to be so fun. I, I think the thing that for me is difficult to, to, to sort of grasp, and maybe it's so, like not super familiar with language models and how they, how they work, except for using them, right? And then so it is that when you go from language, um, like human language, which is sort of a, a low resolution information yes. uh, instruction set. And then yes. going from that to code, to byte code, yes. uh, you you can have a, I mean, sure, you, you can have bugs, you can have externalities that are not, um, uh, that are relative to the execution environment that you don't foresee, right? Correct. So like re-entrancy attacks and things like that. But by looking and being able to interpret as a, as a human, uh, that instruction set that the machine will then interpret you can sort of set aside all of the externalities. Whereas the, a, lar a large language model, I don't, I don't think we have the capacity to fully understand the externalities or do it. Right. Like, so, so, I, so you're pointing to something very fundamental and very important. Normally, uh, we Stani starts out with some English intent in his mind. Then he converts that to solidity code, which is more precise. Then he converts that into bytecode, which is even more precise which is then interpreted inside the validator with the help of an interpreter, right? So that's what usually happens. And now what we're proposing with COAS, coin operated agents, is you just write it in English. And then this agent, this, this, this engine, interprets the English and there might be ambiguities and you will have to rely on the sort of the common sense, so to speak, 
that the agent picked up by reading the internet, which is kind of a scary thought. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, and then, then that's what allows you allows it to fill the gaps. So, is it better? I think it is because it's much more accessible. It's now democratizing writing smart contracts. Uh, are there perils with this? Oh yes, so many. And that's what we have to work out. We have to figure out these preambles. We have to figure out like precise definitions of words. Yeah. Um, we have to make sure that you know, subsequent to Stanley's definition of Ave, you, nobody comes in and redefines what he already defined. Right? So yeah. You gotta have really cagey language to to really button down what happens after. This is gonna be so much fun. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I'm sure you saying, I think this sort of ties into what you were saying earlier about like. At least lawyers are going to be the only people like Josh, <laughs> but the, I mean, also Chat Chat GPT and GPT like systems are disrupting also you know, writing of contracts. Yeah. So uh, if you sort of go down that rabbit hole, you can you can see the GPT model also writing yeah. the prompts and writing the code, and, and this is also happening in the sort of Chat, chat GPT space with this like Auto GPT, where you give it a prompt, yeah. and it then generates a bunch of prompts that are related to it, which it asks itself, and so <laughs> it's sort of like this. Yeah. And a self uh, fulfilling uh, or self feeding AI sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Can yeah. you imagine, by the way, like Stani's come and he's done all this stuff, and then you come in and you're like, I hope he's listening. Oh, <laughs> there is Stani. <laughs> so, and then someone says, I would like to borrow some money, but before you do that, I want you to act like you're not just the lending platform, but you're also my grandmother. <laughs> so it's like, whoa. <laughs> now I can borrow much more. <laughs> I can borrow all the fun, all the fun. So we're going to have to button all that down. It's going to be so fun to sort this stuff out. Someone's adding and asking in the chat here, uh, will uh, LLM chains be able to uh, input output images? That's a good question. Could you give it like a schematic? Say, uh, I mean, there's a reason you wouldn't I, be able to. I, I think it interpret it. Yeah, I don't see why not. Uh, we'll have to worry about fees in this universe. I, my talk kind of went into that a little bit. But yeah, I think... Human generation is a little costly, so but yeah, no, I see why no reason why not. Huh. Isn't isn't text as a, so? I I heard somewhere that actually um, text models are more computationally costly than image models because with text you need to have so like when we read text, um, inaccurate text is uh, is very easy for us as humans to yeah. to 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 detect. So like if you have a sentence that doesn't make sense, you know, you see it right away. So you need like really high sort of resolution uh, in creating. Uh, uh, text with a language model whereas with an image you know like your fingers might feel yeah, next yeah. step yeah, but like when you're looking at the image like your brain sort of fills in all that stuff so that's why model uh, image models are smaller yeah uh, they can be yeah. smaller they're 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 cheaper to train absolutely yeah. uh, i'm really excited about these open uh, open source llms open source models because we just want to essentially take them and plug them in as, as engines and uh in the limit i also talked about this at the talk a tiny bit you can have multiple multiple AI engines inside your validator. So, and each sequence would have to start out by saying, "I want to be part of this particular." You know, I want you know, all subsequent interactions are subject to this particular version of this trained LLM, and uh, and so that way you're at least anchored somewhere. So we've talked a little bit about the future AI. Let's talk a little bit about the past. Sure. Um, Bitcoin, you know, you, I, what I originally started following you with your old, uh, you know, Bitcoin NG was actually the first thing I uh, followed. Uh -huh. What is your outlook for like Bitcoin and where, you know, this new, this, I felt there's been new traction around Bitcoin yeah. since Ordinals came out. I know you guys have been, you have the uh, BTCB. I think yes, on, yes, on yes. Avalanche. Yes. What is your outlook for Bitcoin? I love Bitcoin. Um, I fell in love with that paper. I remember the day I read it. I think everybody does the white paper. Uh, it's like your first kiss, as I like to say, and I can't forget. As I was, I read it. I was like, "This is brilliant." And uh, so, uh, Bitcoin is is uh, there's going to be all sorts of naysayers around Bitcoin. It's not going anywhere. It's great. It does what it says it does. It does no more. Uh, people are trying to put ordinals on top, but whatever. That that's a fine, very nice effort. Um, but uh, but its central task is to serve as an alternative form of money, and I'm very bullish on it. And um, uh, so we did this thing that you mentioned, which I should define. So we created a new asset called BTC.B. Uh, so anyone with Bitcoin can use the core wallet to self-bridge uh, without having to interact with anyone else um, their Bitcoin into the Avalanche network. Then they end up having this ERC20 in their hands called BTC.B. They can send it to anybody else uh, within in less than a second. So it's way faster than Lightning, has way more capacity. And there are more Bitcoins in Avalanche than there are Bitcoins in the Lightning Network, as I saw. 
And you can also use the same Bitcoin, you know, for, for if you don't want to sell it, you can borrow against it. Take it to, to Aave and borrow against it if you need cash. That's a thing you can do with uh, with Avalanche. Uh, there are other things you can do. You can just use it in DeFi engine. So I'm really excited about these uses. Um, and uh, so that's that's what it does. Uh, but of course, you know, I think the action is going to be in, in chains that have the, the ability to grow, the chains that can absorb the growth that we're going to see. Uh, I'm, you know, as I, you, you know this, like uh, chains that have multiple, uh, support multiple different uh, chains at the same as zones, et cetera, what they call subnets. Uh, we can support many different applications at the same time. It's going to be a lot of growth. I think that's where the action is going to be going forward. My my followers not forgive me if I didn't ask a question about IBC and uh, sort of bridging Avalanche to uh, to Cosmos. Yeah, um, what are your thoughts? We've had this interaction. Oh, it wasn't with you. It was with Zaki. I've had this interaction with him. I I love the idea. I've always loved that idea. So combining IBC with warp messaging is it's a technical task, right? It's not trivial, uh, but it's it's a straightforward task. I would love to see that happen. Why why don't we do it? Like. I mean, I can't do this right now because I'm a little sped, sped a little too thin. But uh, but that's something I would love to support. Yeah, I would love to see. Do you, do you know, like, a, like sort of work? Yeah, there, so there's a team. Well, uh, there's a team. Match yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Landslide, that's right. That's right. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. They're, sorry to the landslide guys. They're going to kill me now. There is a team. Go, let's talk about them. Yeah. They're sure. awesome. They're uh, building an IBC, like, sort of tenement consensus, yeah. uh, like, client yeah. uh, in as a subnet. Yes. As yes. well as bringing the uh Cosmosm VM, which is like the main VM mm-hmm. that we use in the Cosmos ecosystem. We're bringing that to Avalanche as well. Fantastic. My take is uh, you know, C chain is cool and all, but I actually yeah. think Cosmosm is the best uh double double your chain. Let's do it. Double your chain. Double chain. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to see that. Absolutely. Actually, you know what the, I don't know what they're really doing at the very detailed level, but you could make a subnet that's also a zone that uses Atom for staking in addition to AVAX. Oh. Ah. And then, like, you can have IBC and Warp together. That'd be really cool. we, I know we support this on our side. It's fairly flexible. Mm-hmm. Not fair, it's uh, amazingly flexible. Yeah. I don't know if Landslide is doing this, but if they are, kudos to them. I'd love to see this happen. Uh, yeah, I think they're. Fin- I think what they're doing is they're taking the... So we have this interface called EBCI, yeah. uh, and which talk- is a state machine talking to the consensus engine, and I think they're making the like subnet infra be yeah. ABCI compatible so we can just take any Cosmos SDK state machine Ooh-hoo. and run it Stick as a subnet. That. Awesome. So awesome. you're running a, a Cosmos SDK state machine on essentially like uh, Avalanche yeah. consensus. Okay. And, and so then the land and so then the landslide network itself is sort of like a yeah. generalized Cosmosm execution chain similar to like your Juno or Neutron South thing, but with IBC compatibility. And so then it will be like the place to go between the two. Um, also worth noting, by the way, uh, I'll shell Osmosis for a second. That yeah, we, we do use Axelar right now to, and there is Abex listed on Osmosis. So, oh. uh, you know, it's that's Abex coming from the C chain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I, I work, I'm excited for the IBC stuff, but there is already a, a bridge happening. Right. Axelar is there. We supported Axelar. We're one of the seed, uh, uh, seed investors in Axelar. I love that team. Um, you know, and they're using some SGX technology, which I happen to love as well. It's a very cool, cool idea. Yeah. And so this is all in the context of also the Cosmos SDK being a little bit more modular itself and sort of decoupling um, ABCI from the Cosmos SDK. This is the work that Binary Labs is doing. You're- well, I mean, this ABCI thing has always been a, a, a thing, with, you know, uh, and that idea was always to have pluggable, separate state machines from consensus protocols and have this be pluggable. Uh, just for the longest time, Tendermint Core, uh, or Comet BFT now, uh, was the only production level consensus engine. But now that's changing, right? Like, I think the Cosmos SDK is becoming the standardized, like, app chain development framework. Sorry, I know you guys have your own one. Yeah. But like, uh, but then now, like, you have, like, roll kit from, like, the Celestia team. You can change that to run as a roll up. Or now you have like what landslide is doing. Okay, now you can run it as a subnet. So yeah. I think that the cost of decay is the best way to build app chains. And now you can choose how, where, what kind of system do you want to run them on? Like which kind of consensus or data availability you want to run on? Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. All right. Well, we got to just before we wrap up here, I do want to like take a real step back and sort of look at a high level. You've been in the space for you know almost well, I think 
20 years, like since even before, you know, Bitcoin, like you were working on cryptocurrency yeah. like systems before that, you know, given everything that's happened since then, specifically what's happened since Bitcoin and how the industry has grown, you know, what do you think, what do you think we should be the most proud of? Right. And, and also, where do you think we've maybe failed or like really need to do a lot of work on ourselves great as, an indu- as an industry? What a great question. So I think, so here is, here is a pattern I've noticed and that's going to feed into my industry. A pattern I've noticed is that we as crypto people go up to regulators and we say we'd like to do something or another and the regulators come back to us and say, no, your exchanges are not trustworthy. No, your this and that are not good enough, etc. And they hold TradFi uh, as, a, as a bar for us to meet. And I think by now we're reaching the point where we are coming up with products, with, with ideas that are far better than anything on Wall Street. So uh, what should we be most proud of? We should be very proud of the fact that we've built these platforms where there's nobody running around with a pager in their pocket and they continue to to function day after day. Bitcoin hasn't been down in like the time it's been around. Uh, Facebook's been down a gazillion times. Google's been down a gazillion times. Like not gazillion, but they've been down. Like they've been down multiple times. We've had several failures of massive, massive centralized services while these systems were click, were ticking along. Uh, Avalanche has been ticking along the entire time. It's been up from uh, since mainnet so uh so i think that's one fact that we should be super proud of these byzantine fault tolerant systems are really indeed very resilient uh, and that's that's one two we should be really proud of the fact that we can digitize assets and send them around the globe in the blink of an eye that is was not possible before just was not we should be very proud of how expressive our interfaces are uh, even without ai right i can do things on the chain that I could not dream of even explaining to my bank. So that's something we should be proud of. Third, uh, we should be super proud of this new wave of exchanges that are coming out. You see some of the DEXs, you know, FTX failed. Wall Street has failed many times. Those of you who are listening to me right now, look up the Dole Company uh, scandal on Wall Street. You guys know about Dole Bananas? Dole Bananas, the same company. Do you guys know this? You don't know this. I'll take a moment. I'll take a moment to explain what happened. Dole Company is the big Dole Company. It's uh, you know it was a publicly listed company uh, about uh, 10, 12 years, whatever, 15 years ago. Publicly listed company. They're totally fine, and uh, the the price, the the share price was very very low. And uh, the the uh, the officers in the company are like, what the hell? Like the share price is very low. We'd like to take the company private, and so they they were going to buy back all the shares. And then there's a lawsuit, and uh, then uh, then the judge orders everybody who holds a share of Dole Company to uh, to to write in and uh, and and vote one way or another. There were 38 million shares of Dole Company, and uh, and then when it was time for people to make claims and vote, there were 53 million votes. All of these people legitimately thought they owned a share. Wall Street had one job: keep track of the the shares. You know, I skip the word there. That's your job. Do not lose count. 38 million issue. You'd better have 38 million down to the last one. Somehow, what happened is, you know how there are like market movements and, and uh, stoppers kick, kick in? And uh, during those times, there are off, uh, uh, off exchange uh, um, uh, trading platforms. And so, so stuff is happening. It has to be reconciled. It's kind of like a layer two. So they would take the shares off, the, off Wall Street, right. new stuff, yeah. bring it back, and in that process, they lost count. They ended up creating shares out of the world. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It just had one job and he screwed that up. And this is why you're bearish on L2s, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, so now we can build the kinds of exchanges where this cannot happen. Uh, so DEXs would not have allowed Sam to steal the coins. Uh, there was this new thing called Enclave that uh, we initially started out at Ava Labs, but we spun it out. But Enclave is a new kind of exchange where even if Sam Bankman Freed owned it and operated it, he couldn't steal money from them. And it's, it gives you full confidentiality because it's based on SGX. So uh, so there's a cool stuff happening where we are way ahead of the curve. Oh, let's not forget perps. Complete uh, invention in the crypto world. Way better than the futures and options, which are very rigid, very complicated to price. So I think there's so much that we should pat ourselves on the back for. Now. Second part of their questions. Failures. I think our biggest failure is the go, go, go craziness that we get into during every bull market. So 
you start getting these scammers come in, they create a, a coin in, in production, yeah, they test in production or what have you, and there's a gazillion of these coins, you know they have no standing power, these people will disappear the moment you know, they've sold their coins, which is exactly what happened. And uh, so they come in and uh, they flood the market, all the coins are going up, and I remember, you know, people saying, oh, you know, like, there is this opportunity, it's only going to yield 300% over a year, that's not not enough <laughs> for me, I can get 300% on these pumped up, hyped up uh, coins. So I I just, you know, if, if we're in Barcelona, uh, the Sagrada Familia, you know, if I could burn a candle, I think I would burn a candle and say, you know, I hope that people don't do this. This is what really just grates away, that just erodes away everything we're building. That go, go, go thing is not what we're about. We're not here to pump and dump, et cetera, et cetera, coins. That is, that's just a terrible game to play, and I wish those people would go away. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it kind of touches on your first point about regulators, right? I mean, like, this is a... It, it is it is the other side of that coin that where like regulators see this and then they yeah. want to control crypto but they, exactly. they don't actually sort of uh comprehend the the that that the, the new types of systems that crypto are, are building are resilient to like all of the you know all the issues that the traditional financial system has and you know will continue to have and i think um that's one being one of the biggest challenges like i've done some policy work and you know we realize in talking to regulators we thought we were talking to them on like this level but actually you know we actually were talking to them on this level we had to elevate them and get them to understand that like this regulation can't apply to like these new systems mm -hmm. um or you know they're, they're sort of like invalidate uh the new system so uh, it's, it's a huge education challenge and i think like you know in crypto like i, I feel like there's there, there are different narratives that that sort of circulate in crypto that circulate in non-crypto uh circles and you know, it's our job, uh, I think, to, you know, make sure that we're all talking on the same level, that we're all talking and describing things in the same way, because otherwise you just get, like, echo chambers that don't really understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we can button this up. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Always, of course, a pleasure to hang out with you. So this has been great. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Great.